This is the Authors in the Schools program, and I am so pleased to welcome all of you here in person. It's presented by the Whistler Writers Festival. I'm Rebecca Wood Barrett, the Artistic Director, and I would like to acknowledge that we are very grateful to be here to live and learn and go to school on the traditional unceded land of the Squamish Nation and Lilwant Nation. We do have quite a few uh, organizations and businesses that make this program possible. Some of them up, up here, you can see them. Armchair Books, our local bookstore, BC Arts Council, Whistler Blackcomb Foundation, Whistler Community Foundation, the province of British Columbia, Libby McKeever, some of you may know her, Rotary Whistler Millennium, Whistler Public Library, and the Rotary Club of Whistler. So this program is really well supported and the idea is to um, encourage students, youth to learn about stories, storytellers, and encourage you to write your own stories. And I am so excited to welcome Jen Ferguson here today. Let's give her a warm round of applause. Thanks for coming. And Jen is Mitchiff Metis and white, an activist, an intersectional feminist, an auntie, an accomplice armed with a PhD in English and creative writing. That's my favorite part. Mine too. <laughs> Her favorite ice cream flavor is mint chocolate chip. Anybody here, mint chocolate chip, love it? Yeah, one of the best. <laughs> Jen's book, The Summer of Bitter and Sweet, is a complex and emotionally resonant book about a Métis girl living on the Canadian prairies. This debut YA novel serves up a powerful story about rage, secrets, and all the spectrums that make up a person, and the sweetness that can still live alongside the bitterest truth. I'm going to hand it over to Jen for a little bit. She's going to talk about the book, and then I'll come back to get into a conversation, think about any questions you may have. Your school has um, 30 copies of the book in the library, so you can read it after this, and some of you may have already started. And, uh, and, and thank you so much for being great listeners. Hello, friends and foes. Um, I am Jen. You can call me Jen. Uh, pronouns are she, her. I have some pictures for you. The pictures include a very embarrassing photo of me when I was 18. So I, I brought that as a gift to all of you. Today, I will tell you a little bit about me, a little bit about my book. I'm going to read a little bit from chapter three. And then I want to tell you a little bit about why I write and who I write for. And then I think I'll tell you why I wrote the book and why I said it in Lloydminster, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and maybe tell you some stories about, about growing up there. And then I welcome your questions. Okay, so The the Summer of Bitter and Sweet is my first young adult novel. It came out in May, which feels like a million years ago and also yesterday. As Rebecca said, it's the story of an 18-year-old Métis teen. Her name is Lou. She has just graduated from high school. The first chapter takes place the week before graduation. Um, and she is working for her family's organic ice cream dairy business. They make ice cream and their theme is like the colors of the rainbow. So they don't tell you what flavor the ice cream is. You just like order a red or you order a yellow and you find out what flavor it is. Um, all of the ice cream is uh, made from edible plants and herbs that you can find on the Alberta prairies. And one of the ice creams in the test kitchen is a mustard ice cream. Would anyone try mustard ice cream? No one's brave enough? All right, yeah, thank you. Thank you, my brave friends. So I, I, told, I told a few people about mustard ice cream. Some of my friends who read the book read about it and they discovered that in the US you can buy a Dijon mustard 
and pretzel ice cream, just like at the Walmart. And a friend bought it and tried it. And she said, it gets better every spoonful you have, but it's nothing that she would ever desire to eat ever again. And then she gave it away to another friend. So Dijon mustard ice cream exists. Lou is um, working at her family's ice cream shack. She is realizing that uh, she's kissed her first boyfriend like 46 times and not felt anything at all. She thinks he's kind of like a fish and it's kind of gross. Uh, so she breaks up with him. And then her best friend from grade nine, King, comes back to town mysteriously. He's been gone for three years and he just kind of shows up and she doesn't know what to do with that. And to add on to um, all of the other pressures in her life, her father, who has been in prison her entire life, sends her a letter and says that he's being released and that he wants to have a relationship with her. So this is something she definitely does not want. But Lou is 18. And as you all know, humans are messy. And we often don't make the right choice. You know, like Lou could have gone to her uncles or her mother and, and told them this, and she doesn't. And that sets off a summer of tumultuous things. I'm gonna read to you a little bit from chapter four. I lied on the PowerPoint. Apologies. This is from chapter four. You need no context at all. The creamery just opened. This is the first day of the summer. I'm lugging this week's batch of yellow out of the insulated box in my truck bed, a creamy blend Dom, my uncle, says will remind customers of dandelion wine when I catch sight of King Nathan. His shoulders are still wide, but he's a half foot taller, 6'1 or 6'2 in his tan boots. His hair has grown. It's not the tight fade he used to prefer. Now it's more like a little halo. His long sleeve shirt is untucked, the top few buttons open. In no time, those sleeves are going to be covered in the flavors of the week. Hey, he says, his back to the tangle of overgrown trees behind the shack. I nod, because what else do you say when you haven't seen someone in three years? In the age of social media, when they left without a goodbye, when they left after you burned it all down with your lies. It wasn't a little fire, this one raged. It might yet smolder. He approaches to help, hefting another batch onto his shoulder. His head is cocked to the side so he doesn't freeze against the tub. Smart move, but King was never without smart. In this town, when he found trouble, he always had his reasons. So you're back, I say. It's not a question, but King Nathan, yeah, he answers it to make sure I know the situation is only temporary for the summer. You gonna talk about where you've been? No, King says hard, but he smiles. It calls the bite a smidge. A crow in one of the trees caused down at us. And I think, yeah, yeah, I know this is weird. King was my first friend here when I showed up in the middle of ninth grade, brand new to a town where most everyone had known each other since birth. He saw me in the hallway, leaning against the locker, wearing my ball cap and hoodie inside, told me that the hat and bunny hug, the ridiculous local term for a hooded sweatshirt, were dress code violations. Peeling off the layers, I made a mess of my hair and he laughed quietly. He offered his locker mirror so I could fix up my look before homeroom. Inside, his locker was stacked with non-school books. Ian Williams, Natasha Ramutar, Dion Brands. He asked if I had anyone to have lunch with, invited me to join him. Our end arrived fast and furious like a sparkler burning out. Right now, right here, I can't dive deeper into that pool. Not while rushing to get ice cream into the freezers before it thaws. Not when I catch the thumbing bass from Wyatt's Range Rover. It clashes with the country song blaring from the speakers, but that's Wyatt. He rolls onto the lot way too fast, like he always does, swerving close to the picnic tables, flicking gravel at me and King. The crow takes off spooked. Is that who I think it is? King's tone is unreadable, at least to me. Yep, I say. Is he still a bit of a dick? Funny, but a dick? I fight the urge to roll my eyes or to tell King everything like we're still friends. The only safe thing to do is nod. We stand in silence as Wyatt climbs out of his vehicle. 
He's wearing expensive jeans. He doesn't let silly things like work sideswipe his style. Doesn't let silly words like no get in the way of what he wants. My ankle aches weighed down by the ice cream. The urge to slap him sparks along my palm radiating down my fingers. But hitting people isn't my style. I don't claw or do violence even underwater where the ref can't see. Maybe I used to out of water for a while after King left. This new version of me, she plays entirely above board in the pool and on dry land. The old King was friendlier. This one, he's clad in a shiny new armor. When over the in-between years, I finally managed to peel most of mine away. This is a bad idea. Wyatt, King, and me working together, but I can't stop it. The kindling's already catching. While they clasp hands and do their guy thing, I form a resolution. I won't play along like nothing went down. I won't make it a big deal either, but I don't have to let Wyatt off. Lou, you didn't tell me the king himself was back, Wyatt hollers, so I'm close enough yelling is not required. To unlock the heavy wooden boards that will lift up, creating our storefront, I climb on top of the freezer. From outside, King latches them easily. She didn't know. Wyatt stares at us as we work. Black man of mystery, that's what you are. It's always like this with Wyatt and his friends. They idealize blackness as the coolest and smash what they've taken into their upscale country boy swagger. And then they expect King to perform something that's not King, but rather this TV stereotype for them, even if he's not gonna let me get close to him again. And I can't blame him for that. I won't let this bad behavior stand. What's wrong with you? I ask Wyatt from my perch on the freezer. He doesn't get it, laughs at me like I'm the one playing the fool. Like he didn't call me his native girlfriend over and over again, emphasis on native, not girlfriend. Why do you have to point out he's black? Why can't he just be a man of mystery? Wyatt, he shrugs. It doesn't bother me, King says, staring at me. Black isn't a bad word, Lou. It's a scold. Even though he told me how sick he was of the people in this town asking him to perform for them. But because it's me, he won't own up to it. Or maybe since he's been gone, he's changed in some fundamental way. I have. All right, that's all I'm going to read for you. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about when I started writing and my process to get to the point where I'm at now. I was um, a, I, I was your age and like writing novels in my basement instead of hanging out with my friends. So that's like my shameful secret. I was deeply uncool and I was okay with it. So I probably wrote about four novels before I started university. And then I quit writing for five or six years before I took it up again. I graduated from my undergraduate degree and I started a master's degree in English and creative writing. And then I did a PhD in English and creative writing. And over all those years, what I was writing was adult literary fiction, you know, really pretty, boring stories that nobody reads. Um, and I graduated from my PhD and I was really depressed. I think that's part of what grad school might do to you. But I hated reading. I hated writing. And I was kind of done with, with thinking about things. Um, and that was a really sad thing for someone who was a big reader and a big writer to, to decide. Um, and what got me back into writing and what got me back into reading was reading young adult novels. So this was like 2016, which is a million years ago. But the YA novels I had to read when, when I was your age, it was like the Babysitter's Club. And that was about it. The, the bookshelves were not very interesting. They were incredibly white. 
incredibly straight, incredibly cis. Um, but in 2016, things changed. And YA books were doing some of the most interesting, exciting things happening in literature. And then I realized I didn't have to keep writing the boring books that were really pretty. I could write really pretty books that were a lot more fun. Um, this is also around the time where I was starting to think more about who I was. And I was starting to come to terms with some parts of my own identity for the first time. So Lou is coming to these realizations about um, her sexuality, about having a white parent and a native parent when she's 18. And this is all stuff I did much, much later than Lou. Um, I also was talking about hope a little bit yesterday at the Whistler Public Library, and I was telling a group of people that I didn't have a lot of hope and that I struggled with hope and hope is really difficult for me. And I came to realize um, by one of the other speakers talking that like, this is, this is my hopeful gesture, writing these books and, and sending them out into the world for, for people like you to read is, that's my hopeful gesture. Um, I also am really angry about the state of the world. Um, I'm really angry about the, the world that we are, are passing on to all of you. And I'm really angry about how we, we treat each other as, as humans and how, how we continually um, show that, that we don't value each other. So that is something that I realized I, I'm continuously writing about. Someone told me that there was a lot in my book and there was too much in my book. And I, my response is always something like this. And that is that there's a lot going on in all of your lives. And your lives are a lot more difficult than my life was at your age. And a lot more difficult than it was at my parents' age. So I realized that what I'm doing is is writing back to that anger. For me, this is one way to deal with all of the things I feel about the world is to write about them. And and like, I didn't title this book. I It had a really bad title when I queried it to my agent and my agent came up with the title and I said, we'll use that, good, good. We'll use that, it's fine. Uh, and I expected someone in marketing at HarperCollins to be like, no, it's a bad title. We need a new one. They really liked it. And I've come to really like it because the world isn't just the bitter stuff that happens. It's not just the bad stuff. There's sweet stuff too. And so this book is, ooh, that's fun. This is not just like the the rough the rough things that you go through in your life, but it's also the like person having a scream attack in the hallway and all of us getting to giggle about it, right? There are, there are good and sweet things in our life as well. So I'm gonna show you a picture of me and I was 18, um, many, many long, long days ago. I know it's really blurry because we didn't have good cameras back in the day. That is literally the quality of the photo you could take when I was your age. Um, I am wearing a hoodie. I probably did not brush my hair that morning. And I am standing uh, in front of these two orange markers that signify the border between Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, this book is set in Lloydminster, which is a town here. That's where it sits on the map, the red dot. 
I used to think of it as Northern Alberta, but there's a whole heck of a lot of Alberta above it. Um, it's about in line with Edmonton. Um, it's very cold. It was the, it was where I, I did grade 10 and 11. Um, and it was also the place where I, I saw a lot of things that I didn't see. So my dad was in the, the military growing up and I was born in Montreal and I grew up in Calgary and I grew up in Toronto, um, mostly really big cities. And then I moved to this small place in uh, the Canadian prairies. And this is the first time that I recognized that living in a woman's body was dangerous. This was the first time that I saw incredibly violent um, hate directed towards Indigenous people. This was the first time that I drove a car and it was a town where there were two things to do at night. One of them was the movie theater and the other one was the bowling alley and they both closed at 8 p.m. So you can imagine the kind of trouble that young people with access to a vehicle got into living in this town. Now, I didn't get into any trouble. I was a very, very good girl. I worked a job. Um, I made pizza. I worked till like four o'clock in the morning on weekends making pizza and sometimes until one o'clock in the morning on weekdays before I went to school the next day. Um, but this was a, a really difficult place to grow up. Um, this was also where the oil workers came and spent their two week vacation with all of their money. Uh, so I, I realized that maybe it was the time in my life like grade 10 and 11 that cemented this place in my mind as somewhere where I need to tell stories. Or maybe it was the fact that I was in a smaller town and things were different in a smaller town. I was in the Canadian prairies and I was in the Northern Canadian prairies and things were, were different there. So what I've, what I've noticed is that this book doesn't like, it's not a very good representation of Lloydminster, but I feel like it's a, real representation of the town. I don't think they're ever going to give me the key to the city and I'm like, invite me in to give a talk. Um, but my friends who've read this book, and maybe this is the last thing I'll tell you before I'll let you ask me questions. My friends who have read this book will be like, that happened to us growing up. And I'll be like, yeah. And they'll be like, but it didn't happen exactly like that. And I'm like, yeah, it's fiction. I, I get to make things up. So this is like, this is a, a real story about what it was like growing up in this town. And then I fictionalized it to make it more fun. All right, I will happily answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Jen. Really appreciate you coming we do have a question right off the top and i'm going to bring the mic over to you because we do have folks online and uh they'll want to know what you have to say what advice would you give to like younger writers out there that are like just kind of starting i i love that question and the answer is keep writing Publication, uh, this is the like 14th book I wrote. And it's the seventh book I queried to agents. That was a long time. And I, I gave up a lot during those periods. And then I started up again. The key is that getting, getting your writing published is it's not always about talent. Most of you go through your, your relationship with craft and you teach yourself how to write. That's not actually the issue. The issue is it's luck and timing. I was a very unlucky person. I still am a very unlucky person. Um, but my luck came through eventually. And I hit the right moment where publishing was hungry and ready for these kinds of stories. So really, it, it's about writing. It's about writing a lot. And it's about not quitting unless what you need to do is quit. 
Great question. I'm so glad that publishing was ready for this book because it is so powerful. Um, it's complex. I love that you talk a, a little bit about how someone said it as a criticism almost that there's a lot going on. I like how much is going on because I didn't feel like I had all of the answers and some of them I could, I could sort of figure out myself and other things were still question marks. And that's more like life because nothing is so tidy as, oh, you did this because of this exact reason. This is, this is the way you are because of this one thing that happened to you. It life is not like that. And it, that felt very honest. So one of my aunties said like, when is the sequel coming out? Because you didn't answer all the questions. And I was like, oh, there is no sequel. Like this is over. It's done. You, you have to either answer the questions yourself or you have to like come to the understanding that sometimes we don't get all the questions answered. Um, I know that I, I'm okay if, if, if you don't want a book that leaves you with that kind of openness. I'm okay if, if the kind of book you want to write or read is like a YA fantasy book or a romance and you want to close all of the, the threads. I, I may blame my adult literary fiction upbringing on the fact that I can't close all the threads, but it is, it is real life. Life doesn't stop. And so my characters' lives, they keep going past the end of the book. Do we have another question in our audience? Seriously, you can ask me anything. Okay, great. Let me bring the mic to you. Okay, thank you very much. I have a question about the feedback cycle for editing of books. You know, what was that process like for you? How many drafts did you go through? And I think that's something everyone in school will be going through is perhaps feedback that seems a little bit harsh, but it is constructive. So how do you work through that as an author and the drafts you have to go through? Okay, so I have to tell you two stories. And the first story is that I wrote the first half of this book on a writing retreat in the south of France in a 10th century, 10th and 11th century house that barely had Wi-Fi. It was so far away from everything that you could not buy a Coke or a Snickers or like tampons in the town that I was in. It was 45 minutes drive down a mountain before you could get to a grocery store. So I wrote the first half of the book really quickly. I then moved to LA for my job and wrote the second half in a month. And then I revised it once to make sure everything was holding together. I sent it off to my agent. Um, when my agent signed me, we revised it really, really lightly. Um, and then when my editor bought it, we revised it really, really lightly. That is not normal. None of those things are normal, writing that quickly, not dealing with a lot of revision feedback. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my second book and it almost killed me. My second book comes out in fall 23, which is a million years from now, but that's how publishing works. Um, it took me a year to write it. I hated everything about it. I hated myself while I was writing it. I thought it was a mistake and I should quit and I should return the money they paid me and just walk away. And then my editor read it and had some pretty significant feedback for me. Some of the feedback was like, you rushed this and you need to develop your characters more. Some of it was stuff that, so my editor is a, a white woman in her, her 60s. She has a lot of power in publishing and she's a good ally but she's a straight white lady. And so she doesn't always understand what I'm trying to do. So one of the, the pieces of feedback I got was her not getting a particular relationship in the book. And that was her not understanding what I was doing, but it meant that me as a writer, I wasn't doing my job well enough because she didn't understand what I was doing. So there is a, a famous writer named Neil G 
Gaiman, and he said something like, when you get feedback, the person giving you the feedback is almost always wrong about what's wrong and how to fix it. But they're not wrong that there's a problem. So when I get feedback and I, I give myself a week to freak out and be angry and be like, they just don't get my art um, and go through all of the emotions that you have when you get feedback. And then I sit down and figure out what's not working. It's usually not the thing they tell me is not working. And it's usually not the, the, the way to fix it isn't the way that my editor suggests to fix it. It's something else. But the fact that someone stumbles when they're reading your work means that there's a problem somewhere that you have to, to solve. That's such great advice. I am going to remember that for the next time I get my feedback and I have the knee-jerk reaction of, no, that can't be correct. You get a week to be angry. It's the oh, rule. Okay, perfect. That's so great to know. I just want to talk a little bit. You talked a little bit about um, hope and you don't feel that hopeful sometimes, but the book was your um, your hopeful gesture. And I found the book hopeful. And what was hopeful for me is that Lou, the two main characters, Lou and King, they go through some really heavy stuff. So they experience violence. Um, there are some terrible lies and secrets that they need to navigate. Um, there is a very threatening character and, and, I, I don't want to give away too oh, much. Oh, his dad is a garbage human. He's a garbage human. Uh, honestly, that his letters to her were some of the most um, manipulative and threatening things I've sort of ever read in a book. And I, and I honestly felt scared for her. Um, and yet, what was hopeful for me is that both the characters figure out a way to kind of navigate and find a way through, which actually seemed a little bit impossible at times. <laughs> I was like, how are they gonna do this? I was reading and reading. It really is a book that you turn the pages because you have to find out what happens to them because it it's not going in a good direction. Um, so I found it hopeful. It's not really a question, but I wonder if if that was intentional to get to that spot by the end. I think that it's maybe irresponsible of me to write a book where we don't get to a decent resolution at the end. I think that might be just like irresponsible of me. So back in my adult literary fiction days, like I ended a novel once where the characters get into a car accident and we don't know if they survive. And the last chapter is like, a we don't know which character is talking. And I like thought that was really artistic and real about life and I just I don't think that that I can I can write for for you all and like leave you with a book at the end where they don't see the solution and the solution for for Lou and her problem is that she's been handling everything by herself and she's doing a terrible job of it because usually we are not so great at solving problems by ourselves but when we rely on our community and on our friends and on our family like the problem is more easily solved. We are all stuck in our context and the context we are stuck in, we usually can't see outside of. And Lou is stuck in her problem and she can't see a way out of it. But when she brings more people in, they help her to like navigate a path. It's not the perfect solution, but like there, there isn't a perfect solution for a lot of things in life, but it's a, a good solution that's going to allow Lou to like continue and go to college, university, and, and like get away from the problem. One of the side uh, or the secondary characters uh, is Florence. And she has bipolar disorder. And we know that's a part of Florence and her story. And, and Lou and her friends, they recognize this and they check in on her. But it's, it's uh, something they accept and they just again, the word navigating comes up. It's, it's not a big dramatic thing. They just, it's like, they know she has this disorder and they, they work with her. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, because that was, I thought that was very, um, a, a caring way to write that character. 
Yeah. So um, one of the critiques that I, I've gotten about this book is that people are really angry. Lou didn't do more to help Florence, uh, who is who is going through a manic phase. Um, and I I keep thinking about how Lou is 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 selfish and going through this novel she's she's focusing on herself and her problems and so in some ways she's letting Florence down by by not being a better friend to her but I also think that that Lou has known Florence long enough and has has lived with Florence as her best friend long enough that she knows that she can't like fix Florence um, she can't get Florence to take her medication if Florence doesn't want to, right? So I think Lou accepts who her best friend is and and what her best friend's struggles are. And like that is that is more valuable than I than I think we realize someone just like accepting you for who you are and being there to help you when you ask for help, but not imposing help and thinking they know what's best for you. I think. You, that is absolutely so powerful and just being a friend who can listen and and Lou does that and she does keep her eye on her so even though she knows she she's not going to actively try to fix or do things she's she's talking about her to King and saying what should we do can you help her in this situation and I'll help her in that situation right you can't be everything for for someone like you have to you have to share and uh, sometimes you're not the right person to help one of your friends, but someone else might be. Uh, one question I have, Lou's got some really dark secrets and she's holding on to them. Um, and they really affect her relationships with her friends. And then as the book carries on, she discovers that there are secrets that are being held from her. Um, and she's she's very self-critical towards herself for holding that secret. I just wanted to give her a big hug and be like, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, but the secret really affects her relationships, especially with King. Could you talk a little bit about that and and your Yes, I can. So my editor said the same thing. Like Lou's really hard on herself. And I'm like, oh wait, I took that right out of my own life. Uh, I'm really hard on myself. And I think that Lou knows that she she messed up when she moved to Lloydminster. Um, so she's white passing and she shows up and she lied to these new friends she was making and, and told them that she was white. She lies to King who is a black Canadian and that really hurts his feelings deeply. Um, so like Lou's going through a lot of, you know, like she's she's angry at herself for what she did and for hurting her friends and for hurting her family who are who are like deeply hurt for being erased. Um, and she's not over it three years later. Like she's in a better position. She she knows herself better and she accepts herself, but she's not over the fact that she lied and that the lie keeps coming back. She thinks she's done with it, but it keeps coming back. I'd like to reach out to our audience here again. Do you have any questions for Jen? About publishing, writing process? I will really answer anything. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Well, um, I was going to say, what was like the main theme of your book? What was like the message you're trying to get across? Because seems like maybe there's multiple themes for books or something because it could be d multiple messages in a book so my my day job what i do um monday through friday is i teach at a private liberal arts college in iowa and i teach fiction writing um and the answer to that is is like yes yeah there's probably more than one theme in a book um and and two, I care more about what a reader thinks the book is about than what I think the book is about. Uh, for me, 
there's something in here about community. There's something in here about like learning who your people are and learning how to rely on your people and that you are stronger with other people around you. There is something, there's a thread about Lou discovering her sexuality. So there's some identity stuff happening where she's figuring out who she is. Um, there are definitely some pretty loud threads talking about colonialism and talking about the violence of the Canadian state. Right. So there's like there's a lot of, of different things that are woven together. And the metaphor I use is how many of you made friendship bracelets growing up? You know, like you have a bunch of strings and yeah. Right. So like my book is like a 16 string friendship bracelet all being knotted into a really pretty pattern. Um, but you could probably pull out each of those strings and call it a theme. Any other questions? I'll check online too. One of the lighter things. Oh, all right. What's your experience with combining activism with art? That is a really great question. Um, so, so one of the things I do is I I go around talking about this book to people. And the last trip I made to Canada. Um, coincidentally i flew into the country and the queen died that night um i'm not going to take the blame for that but that might have been me uh i talked to a room full of yeah right i talked to a room full of 50 to 65 year old white ladies one of them brought her husband he was very very uncomfortable in the room but i spent an hour talking to them i was in a decommissioned methodist church too um, it was a really weird space. And I looked at the audience and thought I could just perform author for them. Or I could tell them all of the things that they don't want to look at in their society. And what I did was I talked about representation in books. I talked about racism in Canada. I, I talked about what it's like navigating the world as, as a woman as a white and a native woman. Um, so one of my like activism things is going out and talking to the people who need to hear me talk. Like you all need to hear me talk a lot less than the, the 50 to 60 year old white ladies needed to hear me talk. The other thing that I, I do is, um, so some of it comes across in my teaching, what I do at university, and some of it is who I am on the internet and my, my outreach on on Twitter and the conversations that I get involved in and the things that I say in public um, that that are like kind of loud statements about the world. So I'm I'm saying things and I'm standing by them and I'm I'm not I'm not being quiet and that's gonna get me in trouble at some point. But I I suspect it's good trouble. Thank you so much, Jen. <laughs> I love that. I think we are getting close to the end of our time. Um, I so appreciated you coming and talking to us. Uh, and and you are so caring too. At the beginning of the book, this is a little unusual, even though, you know, I, I know you can be loud on, on socials. And, um, but at the beginning of the book is a content note and I really felt cared for, and I've never seen that before, is a note saying, if you're ready for some of this subject matter now, that's great. If you're not, that's fine. If you're never ready, that's okay too. And I just thought that was such a, a lovely way to invite us into some of the ideas. So thank you. And I, I hope you'll all enjoy reading the book. It's in the library. And uh, thank you for being such a, a good and interested audience today. So thank you. Thank you.